We've had our one another time, a lot of announcements, and now let's join our hearts together as we think about God, Jesus, our founder. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even our relationship with you, you initiated that. And we praise you for that. Thank you for your love that you reached out to us. While we were sinners, you reached out to us because you desired a relationship with us. Father, you planned it. Your son enabled it. Your Holy Spirit drew us, convicted us. Father, we realize that our salvation is of you. And we thank you for that. Father, we are so grateful that it's not of us. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on you. And because of that, we can rest. Thank you, Father, for being the founder of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We do have a worship theme every week. And most of the time, when you see the title on the screen at the beginning of the service, you can think of maybe some scripture passages that refers to, or something that's really easy to understand about God. This morning, though, you see that word founder and wonder, where's that in the Bible? It's a good question. There's a word, a single Greek word, that gets translated a bunch of different ways in the New Testament. They all refer to Jesus, but sometimes it's translated a prince, sometimes an author, and one time in Hebrews 2.10, captain. They're all trying to get at the same complex word that just means the person who plans out and has the vision for something, but then they go out and accomplish it as well. And Jesus has done that for our salvation. That's important to understand. It's easy to think maybe that Jesus was just a submissive victim of the Father's plan, that he wasn't in on the planning, that it wasn't his vision too. And actually, there, there are some who've become skeptics, skeptics of Christianity because they think the salvation plan is cruel. The Father sends his Son to give his life. But the Bible says differently. Jesus went gladly, and he was in on it. He was part of that planning. Jesus is the, the Greek word is archegos. He is the founder. He was in on the plan. The triune God planned our redemption together. And for the joy set before him, Jesus willingly endured the cross, counting the shame a small price to pay. Jesus is the founder of our salvation. If you're in Christ today, you were part of that plan. Jesus planned to save you. Then he came to do the work of dying and rising again for you and is now in the world, winning one after another after another to get in on that triumph. He willingly left the gaze of angels to seek and save the lost. But once he had died in our place with a shout, he rose victorious. It was his plan all along. He made salvation possible through his cross and resurrection. And now he is getting it done. He is sending his cry of love across the lands from each tribe and tongue and nation. He's leading sinners home. He's the founder of our salvation.
The work of that salvation, though, the work of that message, the core of the message is the cross, where Jesus won our salvation stricken, smitten, and afflicted, Isaiah says. We'll remain seated to sing, come to the cross where he accomplished the work of our salvation. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by man rejected, yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. the founder of our salvation invites us to share in his victory. He rose from the dead. Let's stand to sing of our victory in Christ. Victory in Jesus, 587, if you want to turn there. Sit down. 
that victory is not just for you. Jesus' cry of love is still ringing out through the, throughout the lands. Our mission is to spread that message. Oh, church, arise. Follow your captain. Let's sing of our mission. Scripture is found in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about or surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with that which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Let's pray. Dear God, we pause and bow before you because you alone are sovereign. You've created us, and it is by your hand that we are daily sustained. Today, we again celebrate your son, Jesus, the very author and perfecter of the faith we claim. It's in him that we have strength and perspective in a world where we reside as aliens. And it's because of him that we have a glorious hope in eternity. Father, I pray that we would not have listened passively to these words that we have just read but rather that we would allow them once again to transform our lives. We confess that we come to you far less often than we sin. We allow our sins to to pile up, and sadly we get used to them, and we become lazy in our faith. Help us to lay aside that which might not be sin, but that which is distracting us from you. And help us to confess and forsake that which clearly is sin in our lives, as it especially takes our eyes off your son, Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith. Help us, Father, to not stiffen our necks in pride in these moments and refuse to repent, but help us to bow and say, yes, Lord, I am wrong. Thank you, Father, for the perfect Savior, the the founder of our salvation, 
the perfect model for us to look to daily. For it's his, in his name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Any offerings that uh, would like to be given today can be given to the ushers at the rear of the sanctuary at the end of the service, or you can utilize the offering box as well. So are we now where Christ has led, we will share in that ultimate victory one day. But to follow him now is a path before the crown, this next song says. And part of that path is submission, taking up our cross and following him. It's a fitting last song for us before we open the word. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I will gladly live my life. I will take up my cross and follow him. Remain seated. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Jesus, I find a place to stand and wonder at such mercy that calls me as I am. For hands that should discard me, old wounds which tell me come beneath the cross of my unworthy soul is one beneath the cross of Jesus the path before the crown we follow in his footsteps where promised hope is found how great the joy before
All right, the children can be dismissed to junior church at this time. So we'll have the fours and fives out the back door. And then first through sixth over at this side door over here with Miss Andrea. So the kids can be dismissed. And the rest of us will turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, that passage that we just read for our scripture reading. I wanted to say thank you to all of you who served in music and worship this morning. Just so you guys know, that doesn't just all come together. Being a musician myself takes a lot of time and effort. And so I really appreciate that. And uh, it was it was such a blessing having studied this passage, hearing all of those songs and the scripture reading and the prayer, because it all linked together. Whenever you get called on to be the fill-in preacher, it's always a challenge to know what you're going to preach on. And so this morning I decided to go with the worship theme. And so we're going to examine the passage of scripture that uh, was read this morning. And I almost wish that we could have done the sermon first and then all of the songs and the rest of the worship service afterwards, because... Uh, if you could hear it after focusing on this passage for half an hour or so, I think you'd see ec- uh, echoes of this passage in almost every one of those songs. And so it's a great blessing. But before we get into our passage of scripture this morning, well, let's do this. Let's read it once more. You already read it, but let's read it again just to make sure it's fresh. And then I have a question I'm going to ask you. So it says this, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I told you I had a question as we got started this morning, and the question is this, when was the last time that you were exhausted? When was the last time that you were exhausted? For some of you, maybe you say, right now, I am exhausted as we speak. Hopefully you can stay awake during this sermon. But you ask, Pastor Chris, why would you ask that question? What does it have to do uh, with this passage of scripture? Well, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of people who are struggling with exhaustion. So look with me at verse 3, Hebrews 12 and verse 3. It says this, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest, or so that you do not, what? Become wearied and faint in your minds, lest you become wearied and exhausted. So the author is writing to a group of people who are in danger of being utterly exhausted. And this is not just physical exhaustion, is it? For some of you, maybe you say, boy, I'm exhausted this morning. Maybe it's physical exhaustion. Maybe you were up late last night finishing up that Saturday uh, work around the house and you're physically exhausted. But there may be some of you that were saying, boy, yeah, I'm exhausted this morning. And that exhaustion didn't really have anything to do with how much sleep you had last night. It had to do with your mind and your soul. It was a mental, physical, it was a mental, emotional, spiritual exhaustion. And that's what these people were dealing with. Because you see, it says, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds or in your souls. So now that we've discussed that, I want you to ask you that. How many of you have ever been there? You've been at a place where you were weary or exhausted in your soul. Just raise your hand. Just raise it nice and high. You said There's been a time in my life, if not right now, some point where I was weary, just keep it up, or exhausted in my soul. Look around. If we're to be honest, just about everyone in here, we've been at this place sometime or another. And if you're not here this morning, the chances are you'll be here again soon. So we all need this passage of scripture, which tells us how to respond to spiritual exhaustion. I know that we've prayed several times already in our service this morning, but I'd like to pray again right now and just ask for God to bless as we look into his word together. Heavenly Father, would you speak through your word this morning? 
Lord, I speak to a group of people that are in all different set of circumstances. And uh, some of them may be exhausted this morning. Some of them may be doing fine. But we need this passage of Scripture. This is the passage that you have chosen for us today. And I pray that your spirit would work in our hearts as it is preached, as it is read, as we meditate on the truths here. And Lord, may we feast richly on these gospel truths to sustain us in the week ahead. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How do I respond to spiritual exhaustion? Here it is in a nutshell. Are you ready? Here is the central command of this passage. You must run your race with endurance. You must run your race with endurance. That's what it says right away in verse 1. So take a look again. We're going to keep going back to the text. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That word patience could also be translated endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the, that's the main or really the only command that we're given right here in the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Run your race with endurance, right? So I'll say it again. Run your race with endurance. That's the main point of this passage. So now we need to ask, what does that mean? Let's just think about that for a moment. What does it mean to run your race with endurance. Well, first, what is the race? What is the race that the author of Hebrews is talking about here? He doesn't spell it out, but I think that most of us can pick it up. What's he talking about when he says, run your race with endurance? You can just shout it out. What's the race that he's speaking of? It's, it's your life, right? It is the Christian life, or it is, it is literally your life. This race started the moment you trusted Christ as Savior, and it's going to finish either when you die or at the rapture. Okay, one of two ending points of this race, but this is the race of your Christian life. Now, second question we need to ask is, what is the nature of this race? Is it a 100-meter dash? What do you think? Yes or no? Is it a 100-meter dash? No, what is it? It's a marathon. This is an endurance race. And we know that because the verse we just read, the end of verse one, it says, run your race with what? Patience or endurance. The race of the Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And you are in the middle of that race this morning. Just think about that for a moment. You're, you're somewhere in that race. Some of you may be approaching the finish line. Some of you may have just gotten off the starting blocks. For some of you, maybe you are trudging up a particularly difficult uphill sludge. Others of you may be just sort of coasting on a downhill, nice, easy downhill part of your race. But if you are a believer in Christ, then every single one of you in this room today, you are running that race. As a Christian, you are running. All right, next question. What is the goal of this race? What's the goal of this race? Are we trying to make it to heaven in record time? Hopefully that's not your goal, all right? So we don't want to take this illustration too far. That's not the goal of our race. So then what are we trying to do? Well, the goal of the race is not speed, it's endurance. So a couple aspects of uh, the goals that we have uh, with this race. For one, one aspect of the goal of our race is simply to finish the race, to die in faith. As it said of those heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they per pers persuaded of them and they embraced them. And even though they never experienced the, the fulfillment of God's promises in their life, they died trusting God that he is true to his word. So that's the first goal of the race, just to die still trusting Jesus and clinging to the gospel. But second, we want to become as much like Christ as possible in this life. And third, we want to bring as many people along with us as possible. We want to help others along in the race. Those are the goals. That's what we're after in this Christian life. Now, who are we competing against? Are we all competing against each other? 
Is the goal to see if I can get a higher score than you when we all get to heaven? Is that the goal of the Christian life? Who are we competing against? Not each other, right? We are all on the same team. Instead, we're competing against three different aspects. First, there's a sense in which we're competing against the track itself. There's an ultra marathon. You know what an ultra marathon is? It's a marathon that's over the 26 and a half miles of a typical marathon, longer than that. And uh, there's an ultra marathon that takes place every summer in the hills of Tennessee. And it's called the Barkley Marathons. And this marathon is a 100 mile race. You can look it up sometime if you'd like. I guess they actually made a Netflix series about it. But it's a 100 mile race. And it is extremely difficult by design. Most of the time, it's more like hiking or even trailblazing than jogging. There is 54,000 feet of elevation gain or change in this 100-mile race. And there's a 60-hour time limit. So your goal is to get across the finish line in 60 hours to run 100 miles, 54,000 feet of elevation change. They have been running the race for 32 years, and only 15 people have ever completed it successfully. So if you sign up for the Barkley Marathons, all right, if you even get accepted to run the Barkley Marathons, which I think you have to apply and it's this long process, then your goal, you're not getting there on the blocks looking at the people on either side of you, you know, summing up your competition. Your goal is not to beat the people running next to you. Your goal is simply to finish the race because that's not easy. There's a sense in which the same type of thing is true in the Christian life. In the race that God has set before you, there will be many obstacles. Many of you in your Christian life have already faced what seemed to you at the time like impossible trials. I mean, you came up against a wall and you're looking at it and you're asking yourself, how am I ever going to get over this? How will I ever get over this obstacle? How will I ever get through this? And yet, looking back, you can see that by God's grace, you did. The truth are there are more obstacles ahead for all of us. And yet by God's grace, we can finish the race. Second, in this Christian life, we're competing against Satan. I want you to imagine that you sign up for a marathon, right? You sign on the dotted line and then they tell you the fine print that you didn't read at the bottom of the page. Oh yeah, there's also going to be people shooting at you as you're running this race and like jumping out of the bushes and chasing you with machetes and stuff. And you go, what? I didn't sign up for war. I signed up for a race. Well, I've got news for you. In the Christian life, both of those things go together. Yes, we're running our race, but we don't just face the passive difficulties of various trials that happen upon us in our lives. We face active opposition led by Satan himself. And so we see in verse 3 of our uh, passage this morning that Jesus himself endured contradiction, hostility from sinners against himself, and we will face the same in our race. Finally, in our race, we're also competing against ourselves, my flesh. Say, Pastor Chris, how is that? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Greek word for keep under literally means I beat. It's the word that you would use in Greek if you're going to describe giving someone a black eye. Except in this particular passage, you're not giving someone else a black eye, you're giving yourself one. And so what Paul is saying here is that he disciplines his body for the sake of winning the race. You see, you have a flesh that loves sin and hates God. Can I say that again? Even as a Christian, you have a flesh that loves sin and hates God. You probably already know that. You're well aware of the fact. Now, obviously, you also have a new nature, and yet there's that old part of you that still hates running this race. And just like the Olympian who must deny himself in order to win the gold medal, you must say no to your flesh if you want to win in the Christian life. So we've got our work cut out for us, don't we? That's the race of the Christian life. And some of you this morning may be getting beat up by one of those three things I just mentioned. Maybe it's the course this morning that's beating you up. Life has been hard lately, and it doesn't look like it's getting any easier. 
there's no light at the end of that proverbial tunnel. It's just trial after trial after trial. And sometimes you find yourself asking, Lord, what next? For some of you, maybe you're facing satanic opposition in the form of persecution. Or maybe you're killing yourself through your own sinful choices. And you know it's wrong, but you just can't seem to get out. My goal this morning is not to give you a simple three-step plan for success. The Christian life is not that easy. Rather, I'm trying to convince you simply this, keep running. Keep running. Don't quit. Never give up. As the writer of Hebrews says, run your race with endurance. Or put more simply, don't quit. So how do I do that, right? That's what we're called to do. Okay, Pastor Chris, I get it. I'm supposed to run my race with endurance, but how do I do that? There's got to be some kind of a, of a means that's explored here in the passage, and there is. And so two points this morning, my two main points. First, how do I run my race with endurance? First, lay aside weights and sins. Lay aside weights and sins. So verse 1, right at the beginning. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... We want to focus on this phrase next. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. This first step is all about self-discipline. It's about denying ourselves certain pleasures in order to obtain a greater joy. It's about denying ourselves certain pleasures in order to obtain a greater joy. Professional athletes do this all the time. They have to avoid all different types of substances. First, they must avoid illegal substances. When I was a kid, I remember watching intently as Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa slugged it out to see who would be the first to break Roger Maris's long-standing record of 61 home runs in a single season. Did any of you follow that season in Major League Baseball? It's very exciting. And, uh, and McGuire won with 70 home runs, only to be surpassed three years later by Barry Bonds, who amazingly hit 73 home runs in a single season, and then come to find out later, they were all doping. All of them were on steroids. And it's like, you just can't do that as a professional athlete. How could you just throw away your entire career and everything um, for the sake of, of that illegal drug. They competed outside of the rules. And, and as the Christians in the Christian life, we have to avoid sins, right? We have to avoid, as was mentioned earlier, sins that so easily beset us. But it's not enough for professional athletes to avoid illegal substances. They must also avoid unhealthy substances. So what if Barry Bonds said to himself that season, well, I'm not going to take any steroids because I know it's against the rules. But chocolate cake isn't against the rules. So I'm going to eat a pound of chocolate cake every single day, and no one can tell me otherwise. Is he, hallelujah. All right. Is he going to get thrown out for disobeying the rules? Is he going to hit 73 home runs that season? No way, right? Why? Well, it's not necessarily illegal, but it's very unhelpful and very unhealthy. And we understand that. We understand that there are certain things that may, not be, that may not be wrong or against the rules when it comes to the Christian life. They may not be sin in and of themselves, and yet they can easily become idols. They can become things that we put our focus on instead of the Lord, and they distract us. They're unhealthy for us as Christians, and they hinder us from running the race. There are sports you can follow. There are home improvement projects you can attempt. There are hunting trips or shopping trips or vacations that you could take that are not necessarily sinful in and of themselves, but they can become idols that distract you from Christ. Some of you may be praying for endurance this morning. Praying for endurance. I mean, your life right now is hard and you just need to keep going but at the same time that you're praying for endurance, you're killing your own stamina, whether through blatant sin or through selfish living. I mean, you want stamina to keep on going, but you're the problem. It's your sin 
that's keeping you back. It's your selfishness and those, those, those idols that have crept in and become too important to you in your life that are slowing you down. God's not going to answer your prayer and strengthen you until you lay aside the sins and weights in your life. So how do I run with endurance? First, lay aside sins and weights. But second, you need to look to godly examples. You need to look to godly examples. Verse 1 refers to a great cloud of witnesses that surround us. Who are those witnesses? Verse 1 refers to, we've read it already several times. Someone tell me, who are those great cloud of witnesses? Okay, which saints? Not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're actually all from the Old Testament. And they were just talked about in what chapter? Chapter 11, right? So if we're, if we're reading through the book of Hebrews, there's a studying through the book of Hebrews, which we're not doing this morning. We would have just read Hebrews 11, which was referred to as the hall of faith. And this chapter narrates the life of heroes of faith from the Old Testament. And now the author is telling his readers to draw motivation or inspiration from these people's stories. So perhaps before you've heard the illustration, it's like we're running right in this great big stadium and all these people are in the grandstands, these heroes from the Old Testament and days gone by and they're watching us. It might be that that is the picture that the author is trying to uh, summon or paint for for us. But, But just to be clear, the point in verse one is not obey because Abraham is watching you or, oh, be careful, little hands, what you do, because Enoch up above is looking down in love. Um, rather, uh, as one commentator put it, it's us who are to be looking at them. It's not so much that I'm going to do what's right because they're looking at me. God's watching me, all right? God's eyes are always on me. That's what I should be thinking about. But I can look to them, and I can draw motivation from their lives. I can realize that these people have gone before and accomplished incredible things through faith, and I can follow them. They can be, here's the word, role models for me. They can be role models. Successful athletes often have heroes whom they model after. So if you watched the NBA playoffs this past year, you heard over and over again about how Devin Booker idolized Kobe Bryant as a kid. Kobe Bryant was his role model or someone that he wanted to be like in the game of basketball. And we as Christians need heroes too. So who are we supposed to look to? Well, according to Hebrews 11, we're supposed to look to men and women of faith from the Bible. People like Paul, Joseph, Daniel, David, etc. We also look to faithful men in our own lives, just like Timothy looked to Paul. And Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So there may be people even in this room or people who are alive on earth today whom you respect and you look to their examples and you say, I want to be like that person. I want to do parenting like that couple. I want to be a husband like that guy. I want to be faithful in the church uh, like that woman has been faithful. So people that we model after in our lives today, but also uh, we look to men and women of faith from church history. All right, that's why, I'll just give a little plug for the bookstore, that's why Christian biographies are so important and can be so encouraging, right? Because we are supposed to look to this great cloud of witnesses that have gone before And we're standing on the shoulders of of 2,000 years of church history of people who have walked with God, and we can take great courage uh, from their examples. So we look to all of those people, but what's the problem with all of those people? They are all, let's all say together, they are all sinners. Every single one of them is a sinner. All of them are flawed. In fact, it's intriguing. You could try this sometime. Go to Hebrews 11, work your way through the passage, and instead of focusing on the good in each character, focus on the bad. And it's amazing to see all of the horrible sins that these guys committed. I mean, Abraham put Sarah's life in jeopardy to save his own skin twice. You'd think that he'd learn from the first time, but no, he did it twice. And then he also slept with her maidservant. Jacob stole his brother's birthright and blessing and had children by no no less than four different women. Rahab was a prostitute. David and Moses, two people on the list, were murderers. And if you read the book of Judges, you'll find that Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah were all very, very flawed men. 
So that leaves us in a bind. Is there any perfect example to whom we can look? There is, and who is it? It's Jesus. That's exactly where the author of Hebrews goes next. Hebrews 12, verse 2. We've got this great crowd of of witnesses that's surrounding us, and yes, we draw motivation from them, but ultimately, verse 2, we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we look to Jesus. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Um, We discussed that in in, uh, our worship theme today. The word "R" you might notice in King James is in italics. It means it's supplied. So literally, he is the author and the finisher of the faith. He is... The beginning and ending of faith. He is faith from A to Z. Without him, there would be no walk of faith because there would be no salvation. He is the center of our faith. He is the one on whom we depend. He lived the perfect life of faith in our place. In fact, it is his faithfulness which is imputed to us who believe. So he is our perfect example. That's the point that the author is making here. And given this perfect example, We need to be asking ourselves this question. Okay, Jesus is my role model, right? Jesus is my example. That's great. All right, we can cling on to that. So I'm going to follow Jesus. So what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do that I need to be looking toward and then I need to be emulating? Well, the author of Hebrews is going to focus on two specific things that Jesus did in this passage. And so first it says, that Jesus kept his eyes on the prize. He focused on the joy set before him, right? So there's a famous quote you often hear coaches and inspirational speakers, you must keep your eyes on the prize, right? Keep your eyes on the prize. And did you know that Jesus focused on the prize? Now that might seem strange um, for us to hear, but that's exactly what Hebrews 12, three says. He set his face on the joy set before him. Well, what was that joy? What was Jesus focusing on? What is this joy referring to? Uh, Well, a couple of things I would argue based on Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11, that the main aspect of the joy set before Christ was his exaltation. And so in Hebrews 2, 5 through 11, it says that he endured the cross, um, that he was obedient to the death of the cross, but then as a result of that, he has been highly exalted. Therefore, He is highly exalted and he has been given the name which is above every name that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus somehow mysteriously, and I don't understand how this all works, but somehow mysteriously Jesus has a higher place intrinsically, In his person, he is exactly the same as he has always been. And yet somehow, for all eternity, he will have a special glory because of what he did in purchasing our redemption on the cross. He will be praised throughout all of eternity, not as the just the eternal son of God who was active in creation, but as the lamb who was slain. Jesus will be glorified because of what he did. And so that is a part of the joy that was set before him. He understood that as he endured the cross. And that was one of the things that motivated him. God has promised incredible joys to us as well if we will endure in the Christian life. We just sang the words from uh, beneath the cross of Jesus. How great the joy before us. Very intentional words. That joy set before Jesus, his exaltation, the joy set before us to be his perfect bride, that we are going to be with him forever, glorified at his right hand forevermore. Wow. Incredible promises that God has given to us, and and we don't have enough time to go through all those, but, but you ought to be thinking of those, and you ought to be using those as motivation to keep going in the Christian life. Another aspect of the joy set before Christ was the joy of his people. Christ died because he loves us, and his anticipation of our future joy in salvation was another factor that motivated him. This is just incredible to think about, right? I mean, to just, in, in in a sense, get inside the mind of Christ as he is going through 
with his passion, as he is being as he is being scourged with the cat of nine tails, as he is being nailed to the cross, as he is being mocked, and, and to realize that he had the power to call, as the song says and the scripture says, 10,000 angels, right? Legions of angels to come to his aid. And that he set that aside and he continued to endure the race, the course that had been set before him that he had chose for himself as we saw this morning. Why? I mean, we're seeing his motivation because he knew that when it was all over, he was going to be exalted because he knew that what he was doing would purchase salvation for all of us. One hymn that I love about missions says this. It says, look to the throne for the sake of his name. Think of the throng who will share in his reign. Some for whose souls we pray will share our joy that day joining our song for the sake of his name. Another old hymn says, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Who will be in heaven instead of hell for all eternity? Because you didn't give up in your Christian race. Because at that moment of difficulty, you didn't quit, but you kept going. You put one foot in front of the other, even though your side was cramping and it was hurting and you were exhausted and you felt like you were about ready to literally pass out and faint on the ground, as it says in Hebrews 12, 3. And yet you kept going. We'll be in heaven because of that, because you didn't stop praying, because you persevered through this current moment of hostility. Brothers and sisters, if we want to endure like Jesus, then we, like him, must be focused on the prize. So the first thing Jesus did as our example is that he focused on the joy set before him and we must do the same. But the second thing that he did was that he endured the cross. He endured the cross. Now, obviously, there were many awful things about this cross, but our passage specifically focuses on two aspects of it, of Christ's suffering, the shame and the hostility. Look with me at verses two and three. Looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, what about it was so difficult? Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for considered him that endured such contradiction, such hostility, shame and hostility. Now we don't live in an honor shame society. If you would uh, talk to sociologists, uh, people who study different cultures, they'd say that there's various things that motivate people in different parts of the world, various uh, worldviews or way that they think about life that affects the choices that they make. So it's difficult for us to appreciate the significance of shame to many other cultures around the world. However, just consider some of the choices that were made. Consider the fact that in World War II, Japanese soldiers um, in mass committed suicide. Many of them committed suicide rather than allowing themselves to be captured. Now, why did they do that? Was it because the United States was known for torturing its prisoners of war? Was that the reason? Not at all. Quite the contrary. So why do they do that? Well, it's because they had been told from the time they were little children that the most cowardly thing you can ever do is to surrender. And if you ever do that, you will be heaping shame on yourself. You'll be heaping shame on your family. You'll be heaping shame on your nation. It would be better for you if you weren't even alive. That's what they were told. So that's what they did. It was all about honor and shame. And in Roman Empire in Jesus' day, um, crucifixion was considered the most shameful way to die. Okay, so, so Jesus' day, it was, it was more that way, more of an honor-shame society than we currently live in. And, um, and one famous orator named Cicero said this. He said, um, let the very mention of the cross be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind his eyes, his ears. So what he's saying there is that, um, yes, it's illegal for a Roman citizen to be crucified, but he's going beyond that. And he's saying <clears throat> that a Roman citizen should never even have to watch a crucifixion. He should never even have to think about a crucifixion. Nobody should ever even have to tell him the details of a crucifixion because it's so awful and it's so, so shameful and it's so beneath him. To be crucified was to be treated worse than an animal. And here's the assumption that people generally had. If you're crucified like that, you deserved it. And that's all you are worth. You're probably worth less than an animal, which is why you got yourself crucified. Serves you right. Our Savior was shamed on the cross. 
And throughout church history, people who have identified with Jesus have had to share in his shame. The earliest known pictorial depiction of the crucifixion is a piece of Roman graffiti dating to about 200 AD. I decided to show this to you this morning, even though it's, it's repulsive, so you would get an idea. It's a picture of a young man <clears throat> worshiping a nude, donkey-headed figure who's hanging on a cross. And the caption scribbled out there in Latin reads, Alexamenos, or Alexander, worships his God. They've always made fun of us, folks, from the very beginning. Turn back to Hebrews 10, verses 32 to 34. Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. <clears throat> The author says this, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, they got saved, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them who were so used. For ye had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring inheritance. And so according to this verse, <clears throat> was one of the major ways that these people whom the author of Hebrews is writing had suffered. They had suffered reproach. That means, uh, according to one Greek dictionary, an act of disparagement that results in disgrace and insult. You have been insulted. You have been made a gazing stock. You have been made a spectacle. You have been made a laughing stock to everyone around you. And just in case you think that these people had thicker skins than us and it just kind of didn't bother them, they didn't like it. We know they didn't like it, not just because of human nature, but turn over to Hebrews 13, 12, and 13. All right, now go to Hebrews 13, 12, and 13. This bothered them. This really bothered them. Because the writer of Hebrews had to encourage them, as we've seen in chapter 12 and also in chapter 13, He said, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And the idea there is that he he was shunned away from everyone else when he suffered. And it says, let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, bearing his shame, bearing his insults. And so he's telling them, guys, look at what Jesus did for you. He was shamed outside the camp. He was pushed away. He was totally ignored. And so let's go to our Savior outside the camp. Let's embrace the shame of the cross because of what he did for us. These people needed to be encouraged in that way because shame wasn't easy for them to stomach. And it isn't easy for us either, is it? I think more and more so in our culture, shame is more commonly being used as a tool to silence people. You don't need me to tell you this. It's all around us. If you believe in six-day literal creation, You have no place in higher academia. You don't deserve to teach our children because you are intellectually inferior. You are dumb. You are stupid. If you believed what the Bible actually says about sexuality, you're not only wrong, you're immoral. You're wicked. You're hateful. You deserve to be censored, harassed, to have angry people shouting in your face. How are we to deal with this kind of shaming? Well, how did Jesus deal with it according to Hebrews 12 too? Let's take a look at that. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him <clears throat> endured the cross. What's that next word? Despising the shame. Don't you just love that phrase? I love the strength in it. Christ didn't just put up with the shame. He despised it. It captures something of the holy defiance in his attitude. He refused to let it affect him. He didn't care what anybody else thought as long as his father was pleased. Imagine this. Imagine that you're a world-renowned artist, okay? And so your paintings are hanging in famous art galleries all over the world. Multi-millionaires proudly display your art in their homes. You're filthy rich. You're super famous. And as part of your philanthropic efforts, I'll get the word out, one day you go and you present to a class of kindergartners about art. And as the big final, you know, wah moment, you pull out your, one of your paintings, And you show it to them. And they're all kind of looking at it. And then this little um, snot-nosed boy in the back row has the audacity to yell out, that's ugly. 
And the and then some of the other teacher, some of the other kids start joining in. Yeah, I could do better than that with my crayons. And you realize these kindergarten kindergartners are heckling you. And the, pre, the, 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 the teacher is mortified. She's trying to shush them. But as this world-famous artist, what do you do? Do you go home and cry into your pillow, hide under your, your blankets and cry into your pillow that night? No, it, it doesn't bother you. Why? Because you know that these kindergartners have no idea about art. They don't know what they're talking about. And, and the, the people who understand it most, they have affirmed you. They said, yeah, this is, this is the best. This is, this is amazing, right? And so, and so you shrug it off. And similarly, Jesus knew he was the son of God. Those who rejected him had no clue what they were talking about. They didn't know his God. They didn't know his father. And in the same way, we must despise the shame that's heaped upon us because the fact is this world has no clue. They have no clue. So Christ endured the shame of the cross, but he also endured the hostility. He endured the shame and the hostility. This word contradiction in verse 3, it can also be translated hostility. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like it when people are mad at me. Anybody like it when someone's mad at you? Had someone shouting at you recently, angry at you? Not very much fun, is it? But this world is full of hatred. And if you actually live by your convictions... If you enter into spiritual warfare, then the hatred of this world will be directed at you. I mean, think about it. Satan is no dummy. He doesn't need to bother with a Christian who's over there on the sidelines picking his nose. If you make up your mind, though, to storm the gates of hell, he's going to unload his arsenal on you, and it's not going to be pretty. Now, if that's true, and I believe that it is, if Satan attacks you more, the more you're doing for God, how much opposition must Jesus have faced? How much hatred? How much violence. We don't have to use our imaginations, do we? If you've read the Gospels, you know all kinds of people hated him to the extent that they tortured and killed him. When people get mad at me, you know how I feel? I feel weak. I feel like I've been punched in the gut. And it makes me feel tired and discouraged. And that's exactly how the writer of Hebrews tells us not to respond. You're being shamed. You're facing hostility, but don't be discouraged and don't give up. Look again with me one more time, the last part of verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction from sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. We need to toughen up. We need to be ready to face the hostility that is thrown against us. Look really quick at what the author says in verse 4, just because I think this is fascinating. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, You see what he's saying there? Dads are known sometimes for tough love. They're known for lines like, why are you crying? I don't see any blood. Um, My children were up in my office this morning, and uh, they wanted my attention. And I was working on this PowerPoint. And they kept coming back down and down. And every time they came down, they had a story that included blood. Because they know that unless there's blood, dad's not coming. So at first it was, there's blood. And then they came, actually, that was just dried blood. You could probably never mind that one. Oh, there's blood again. So it's, right, I don't see any blood. What's the problem? Now, sometimes that can come across as unfeeling. It's pretty much exactly, though, what the author of Hebrews says in verse 4. Why are you guys ready to quit? I don't see any blood yet. Your brothers and sisters around the world are literally shedding their blood. They're literally being martyred for their faith. You're just being made fun of. You lost some money. People are mad at you. Toughen up, soldier. I think sometimes we could use a bit of that grit. But of course, where does it come from? It doesn't come from just pumping ourselves up. I mean, if we want our children to stand for Christ amidst persecution that maybe is coming, how do we do it? If we want to toughen up, where do we turn? To whom do we look? When we're fearing, we feeling weary and exhausted, and the answer to all of those questions is found in verse 3, words 2 and 3. And it's simply this. It says, what are the second and third words of verse 3? Consider him. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You say, I know that. Jesus endured the cross. No, no. Meditate on that truth. Go on a walk and think about it for a while. Let it really soak in. Read through some gospel accounts. Pray through some of those passages. Don't just take a passing glance at Jesus. If you are spiritually exhausted, can I urge you? Set aside the sin and the distractions that are weighing you down. 
And then get alone with Jesus. Take some time to meditate on him through his word. Pray. Allow the things of this earth to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then get up and keep running. And don't you quit. Never, ever quit.